Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great episode of CPAC Live. We promise we'll always bring you the most interesting guests from the most interesting places, and many times that's America. But today we're joined by um, a real leader uh, in the state of Israel, Naftali Bennett, and uh, we'll be joined a little later in the program by Jason Killian Meath, someone who's partnered with our team here at the ACU to uh, put together a documentary of CPAC's travels around the globe last year. Uh, it's something you really won't want to miss, uh, an award-winning documentary uh, that Jason has pulled together. But first, uh, we want to bring in Naftali Bennett, uh, who's a member of the Israel's Knesset, and uh, which is obviously their version of their Congress, their legislature, and someone who was just recently uh, Israel's uh, defense minister. Great to be with you, sir. Great to be here. Uh, and as I said, defense minister, I think more accurately, foreign minister, uh, it's a, that, that must be an awfully interesting job uh, for the state of Israel. Yeah, well, actually, I was uh, the defense minister, and uh, I spent uh, my younger years as a soldier and officer in, in uh, the Israeli commando units, so it was sort of uh, closing the cycle. Yeah, I Israel, I think, is, is the most uh, threatened uh, little country in the world. It's uh, pretty remarkable uh, w when you think about it. You've got Hezbollah in the north, you've got uh, Iranian militias in Syria, you've got uh, ISIS, still ISIS in, in the Sinai and Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza. And as Minister of Defense, um, I'm the guy responsible to, to fend off uh, these threats and uh, keep Israel secure. And I can tell you that Israel's doing a remarkable job of, of uh, defending itself, defending the free world, while at the same time building uh, an amazing country you know, throughout all this uh, process. Now, uh, tell us, uh, Naftali, you were, um, you had this most important uh, uh, cabinet post, but you don't any longer. Uh, it's one of the uh, aspects of Israeli politics where things can change very quickly. What changed for you? Well, uh, there were elections, uh, and uh, we didn't uh, get into the government this time. On, I'm uh, in opposition. Actually, it's the first time I'm uh, a member of uh, Knesset in opposition. I served as a uh, economy minister, uh, education minister, and defense minister of Israel. So sort of have the the full uh, spectrum, and it's uh, very interesting to be in opposition and uh, uh, a new experience, though I have to tell you that it's much more, uh, you know, fulfilling to actually do things than to oppose things. Well, we, just because you're now uh, in the opposition doesn't mean that you're a political adversary in any sense of Mr. Netanyahu, correct? Yes, it does, uh, though I've decided to, um, you know, support policies that I think are correct and oppose policies which I think are wrong. So when when the prime minister has got it right, uh, I'll, I'll be there. So it's it's pretty peculiar here for for an American to understand. But, yeah, it's uh, we've got a very interesting political system. Well, maybe I should word it better as a question. Do you still have? Uh, a good relationship with Mr. Netanyahu, or is this going to change things? Well, um, you know, Netanyahu and myself have been um, political rivals for quite a few years uh, within the right-wing conservative uh, part of Israel. I'm sort of the head of the right-wing. He's the head of the Likud, which is the, the biggest party. And, and we pull to, you know, the, the, the more hawkish and the, and more conservative uh, in terms of economy, uh, we, we, uh, we're sort of to the right. So we've never had a remarkable relationship, I can say that. But I'm here in, in this business uh, be, because I love my country and uh, I want to serve it. I'm not in to please or oppose any individual. So I can kind of understand your role because uh, in America, the ACU and other groups, although we're not a political party, our job is to stand up for conservative values. And although we're lucky enough to have a president that seems to get it right almost every time, um, our job is to kind of hold hold tight 
to those conservative values that we think will make America even better. So I think we can have an affinity for each other. Yeah, and and uh, I can tell you that uh, Israel's direction is by and large good. Um, I, I spent a decade of my life uh, in the high tech center is, uh, area before uh, entering uh, politics, and Israel's uh, high tech uh, industries is just booming. Um, <laughs> just an amazing amount of of entrepreneurs. Always, it's sort of this one big Silicon Valley here in Israel. Um, while by being strong vis-a-vis uh, -vis our enemies, primarily Iran, which is sort of an octopus, which is, is trying to envelope us from all, all the uh, directions, we're, we're being very tough with them. Uh, America, uh, the administration, has been um, remarkable uh, in supporting us and in, in applying uh, crippling sanctions on Iran. And, and all of that together, and coupled with uh, 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 taking out uh, Qasem Soleimani, uh, has given us a lot of backwind and fighting Iran uh, and, and uh, you know, pushing them back to their place. They, they've got no business around uh, Israel or the world. So the shift in America's foreign policy under President Trump, uh, you fully support? Well, I, I have to admit that the, the early uh, indications had, had seemed that, that he was sort of going to uh, cloister uh, a bit more, but his actions were pretty amazing. I mean, the the um, the sanctions, as I said, which are the the strongest sanctions Iran has ever incurred, because they're trying to move forward with a, a nuclear weapon and their uh, regional and global um, export of terror. These guys export terror day in day out. It's it's unbelievable. They wake up in the morning and think, how can we kill more? Uh, free people in the world, and and that together with uh, taking out uh, Qasem Soleimani were, were uh, dramatic actions in in this region and and helped uh, stabilize the region. Uh, you know, everyone in the region was happy when that uh, that that guy was taken out. That's right. I, I agree with you completely. A lot of people over here were happy too. Now, one of the reasons why is Israel is enjoying so much prosperity in terms of. Uh, their economic growth, and you talked about high tech, we've seen the advances in uh, pharmaceuticals and in other industries, is because of what happened 53 years ago uh, in June 1967, where Israel was able to kind of consolidate uh, these biblical lands. T tell our viewers why that is still important today. First of all, when when you uh, ask the question, I sort of get uh, goosebumps uh, remembering that moment. I I hadn't been born, but uh, we 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 all uh, uh, understand that was a pivotal moment in Israel's history. You know, the Jewish state was back then only 19 years old. Um, all the major Arab states back then uh, teamed on Israel to destroy it. This very very young Jewish state talking about Egypt and Syria and Jordan and Iraq and everyone, Let, let's kill the Jewish state uh, when it's still small. So they closed on us uh, and, uh, and ultimately on uh, June 5th, 1967, Israel preempted uh, uh, and, and within about a couple of hours, the Israeli Air Force effectively destroyed um, most of uh, our opponents' uh, air forces, and uh, and uh, so so we took out uh, Egypt and uh, Syrian uh, um, uh, air forces, and and that effectively gave us uh, a huge advantage. And then in one fell swoop, within six days, uh, we captured and, and recaptured uh, the Golan Heights, Judea and Samaria, which is really the the heartland of of, of the Jewish home and uh, the Sinai. Uh, we united Jerusalem. You know, when you see the Western Wall, people forget that during those 19 years, uh, Israelis could not come to the Western Wall, could not come to the temple. So it was like coming home. Um, you know, as a Jew, uh, I, I, I always think that I'm part of a very, very long um, chain and, and uh, you know, I'm just one part of that chain, but the chain starts almost 4,000 years ago, right here in this land. I'm speaking from Jerusalem, so it's 
my, my forefathers lived right over here where I'm sitting, though probably a, a lesser building than the Knesset, spoke the same Hebrew I speak and uh, believed in the same uh, uh, belief that I do. So it, it, it was coming home. That's what the Six Day War was all about. So in the modern context, all democracies have to be concerned with propaganda that has infiltrated in too many cases media outlets and stuff, something that uh, our president, President Trump, has called fake news, which is it's hard to get the truth uh, in news outlets. I'm sure you have the same problem uh, in Israel. And part of this propaganda is Israel is a brand new state uh, post-World War II, uh, grabbing the lands of other people, including the, the, the Palestinian people and other kind of monikers that they use. Uh, how do you, how did how does someone like you handle that kind of propaganda when it's not the state of Israel and its claim is not put in the proper historical context? You know, it's tough. Uh, the the anti-Zionism and uh, anti-Israel is is the modern um, uh, I'd say a manifestation of anti-Semitism. Um, but you, you keep to the basics, and, and and the basics are really simple. Um, this is our home. We were kicked out forcefully a while back. Uh, we never for one moment forgot that uh, Jerusalem and Israel uh, is, is our only home. Uh, we've got one Jewish state, a small one, the size of uh, New Jersey. <laughs> Did you know that that Israel is, is pretty much the size of the state of New Jersey? That, that's how small the entire country is. And we're surrounded by 22 Arab states. Uh, many of them want to wipe us uh, out. Um, almost none of them are democratic. Uh, and we're the sole free nation here. We try to do our best. Um, you know, people here, uh, we're Jews, so there's a lot of free speech. <laughs> Everyone exercises their free speech here. It's a very, uh, uh, you know, a nation that has a lot of uh, arguments, but that's the beauty. And we're building a remarkable state. We treat our uh, uh, one and a half, two million Arab minority uh, with full equal rights. They vote for the Knesset. There's members of Knesset that are Arabs. There's Supreme Court judges that are Arab. We, we, we do not apologize to anyone about who we are and what we believe. And I'm darn proud to be Israeli. I'm proud to be here, to fight for my nation, uh, and, and just to remember what it's all about. Now, your parents uh, were Americans. Is that right? American citizens? That's correct. My, my parents uh, uh, grew up in San Francisco and studied at Berkeley. And uh, when the Six Day War came about, they had barely any connection to that remote Jewish state, you know, they, they imagine there's camels here and I don't know, desert or whatever. Uh, and, and right after the, the Six Day War, they came to Israel, fell in love uh, and stayed. And, uh, and uh, that's why I, I feel very fortunate to have grown up in Israel, to have served in the Israeli uh, commando forces, fought for my country, uh, defended my people. There's nothing uh, more noble than someone uh, fighting and defending uh, his people, his country. And at the same time, uh, we're, we're, we're the forefront of the entire free world fighting uh, radical Islam. Um, so, so I think, you know, putting the values aside, let's just talk the in interests for a moment. Because we're here within this mess of, uh, of uh, hundreds of millions of, of people, including uh, many which are terrorists and, and uh, radical Islamists, we're fighting them. We're gaining intelligence, methodology, technology, how to fend them off and sharing it with the rest of the world. As Minister of Defense, I, I can tell you that in many cases, we'll call up a European country or someone else and tell them, you know, right now there's uh, Islamic terrorists on, on, on this in this apartment um, and, and go, go get them because we'll run into this uh, intelligence, you know, I, 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 while while uh, working for our own defense, we're doing a lot of good for the world and, and we're proud of it. But I also have to say one last thing, um, you know, knowing that America is there for us means a lot. We, we will never, ever ask America 
to send soldiers to fight for us. No, we will always defend ourselves by ourselves. But knowing that you're there, knowing that you care about us and, and you care about this little country because we, we truly share the same, same values um, means, means a lot. Not so, totally. As someone who has spent many years in America, you've run businesses in America, your parents uh, were Americans. Um, when you look at America today and you see that the bipartisan consensus that the state of Israel is a democracy in the Middle East, that we should have a close allied relationship with, that we have shared values, uh, values that go as far back as the Bible, uh, and the understanding of the founding of America and the founding of Israel, um, does it trouble you that that bipartisan consensus has been ripped apart as now you have the Republican Party standing up and being uh, very closely aligned from a national security and a cultural sense with the state of Israel, but the Democratic Party taking many huge steps back uh, and really courting some of these extreme anti-Semitic, anti-Israel uh, voices within their political coalition. I mean, is that a troubling sign? Yeah, we're profoundly worried about that. I, I'm worried about that because uh, Israel should not be a, par a, uh, a partisan issue. It should be bipartisan. Uh, we're doing good. We're doing good, not only well, but we're doing good things for the world. And, and I, I think we're a, a model country for facing real problems it's not, it's not easy here. I mean, the, the, the cards we, we've been dealt are tough. Yet within this uh, very, very tough environment, we're, we're trying to do our best, uh, you know, with, with a very clear moral compass of what's right and what's wrong. We're not perfect, but we, we really try our best. And, and we would expect that any uh, decent-hearted American uh, w w would see that. I mean, w what's the dilemma when, when on, on the other side of the the border, people are being butchered for, uh, um, you know, uh, speaking their minds or, or uh, you know, opposing government. Uh, the, you get you get murdered, or for women driving, or God knows what. Uh, and and here you've got a, a wonderful country. Uh, I, I don't see the dilemma. There is right and wrong. We will never, and we never, uh, go out uh, um, to, to, to just hurt anyone uh, except if it's in self-defense. The, the moment our enemies lay down their, their weapons, th there'll be peace, not a moment before. Well, we understand that. Um, our CPAC community understands this. Naftali, we're working with some great Americans the Marcus Foundation, the Moskowitz Foundation, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, our new friend Ed Lewis, uh, Sandra Gerber, and many others uh, to make sure that the relationship between freedom lovers in Israel and freedom lovers in America stays strong. We've come to your country. We want to come back and do a CPAC uh, in Israel very soon. And we so much appreciate you being our guest on uh, CPAC Live. Thank you very much. And again, uh, I, I thank all your viewers. I know how much you support us and uh, waiting to see you here. Well, we're going to be uh, right back with CPAC Live uh, right after we watch this video about CPAC's travels um, overseas. The whole world is watching. So come back with us right after this video. And thank you so much, Naftali, for being with us. Thank you very much. This morning, anti-government protests in Hong Kong reaching a new level of violence. We would hear people say, I will die for freedom. And they meant it. Well, we're here to support you. I, I know, I know. The movement is now receiving support from members of the Conservative Political Action Conference. The group joined student protesters, some as young as 12. During the Reagan years, CPAC was much to the right of even where President Reagan was. And now it is the Republican Party. People all over the world we're saying it's now our time to pursue this kind of freedom. We've got about 28 different countries now that are asking us to help them put on CPACs in their own countries. Sounds awfully exotic to this Kansas kid. Freedom is not passed down in the bloodstream from one generation to another. Freedom instead, you gotta stand up, you gotta fight for it, you gotta defend it. Socialism and communism are 
about one thing only, power to the ruling class. As CPAC goes around the world, it makes us allies in a sense that we're all fighting the same thing. It is an inflection point of what kind of a life do you want to live? You don't make the stand now, it may never come again. What does CPAC matter that much? Why are these communists so afraid of letting someone simply give a speech? I'm just one of the thousands who were arrested. The situation in Hong Kong is dire. The home of Hong Kong media tycoon was attacked early Thursday morning by a firebombing. They were sending us a very clear message that it was time for us to leave. How's CPAC doing good? Uh, my man, stand up, please, will you? He's the one who said you should run. Well, President Trump loves CPAC, and CPAC loves President Trump. You know what I like about this? Number one, I'm in love, and you're in love. We're all in love together. We've done something that nobody's ever done. Right? I want to see if you do recognize like this. <laughs> you would hear them talk Portuguese, and then they would say, fake news. And people would just start screaming. The Home Affairs Minister is encouraging a cavalcade of intolerance to continue at CPAC's talk fest of hate. CPAC was a debate within the Australian Parliament. The First Amendment that we have in our Constitution, which is a concept that we think is mostly accepted in these other free countries, actually isn't. Good morning, deplorables. How about that? We just want to make sure that the direction America is going is in the right direction. Frankly, it's not cool on many college campuses to come out and say you're a conservative. Can you tell me about your button? Sure, button. Socialism sucks. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory if you ask me. The whole world is watching. What does America do in 2020? It's not an American question. It's a question they're asking in all the major communities around the globe. Because right. you ain't trying to hear nothing about no socialism and all that foolishness. You need to come here with other like-minded right people. Well, that's a great video. Um, and it kind of uh, makes me a little bit emotional, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, we're now joined by Jason Killian Meath, uh, who uh, really uh, did a gr spectacular job of compiling compiling these videos from our travels around the world and has pulled together this documentary, CPAC, The World is Watching, which Jason, uh, we've won some awards for apparently. Yeah, you know, it's not every day that uh, you can have a uh, film based in freedom and liberty uh, with liberty loving people in the film and you get a bunch of uh, positive feedback from Hollywood in New York, but um, we managed to do it. Uh, right now, there's not a lot of film festivals going on because of the lockdowns and the, and the COVID and everything else. So mo most of the film festivals are being done online. And we actually, uh, the, the film uh, won the uh, best documentary at the Top Shorts Festival, which is the world's leading online film festival and then followed that up with another win uh, of a best documentary, uh, as well as the best film that created social awareness. And as you can imagine, wow. at these film festivals, you know, I mean, there's a lot of films, a lot of documentaries, especially, that have all sorts of social awareness, usually not the type of social awareness that our film uh, projects, and that is uh, that you know, socialism is in danger, very, very uh, dangerously taking over and creeping into countries all over the world. And so yep. for, for the judging uh, panels in these film festivals to acknowledge that as, is very, very exciting. Do we have any gold statues or cash awards? <laughs> yeah, the gold statues, uh, because we can't go up and receive our, our statues on, you know, on the red carpet, they're gonna probably be mailed. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a trophy case here at the uh, American Conservative Union that also has the flag that uh, President Trump has hugged and kissed. So uh, th these are pretty uh, important historical uh, artifacts. Uh, Jason, what do you account for this? Is it 
I know you're you look, you're a talented guy. You and I have worked together for years. Um, I know that uh, you know what you're doing when it comes to compiling and putting the, the, these types of videos together. But like, what do you account for the fact that it's winning awards? Uh, you know, I, I, I think I, I have a theory about this. You know, because people, these, these Hollywood types and, and you know, New York uh, Hollywood film community types, other documentarians and, and, and such that, that sit on these judging panels aren't out in public uh, showing what, who they voted for and who they supported because it's all online. Maybe we're having some success with that. Uh, but I also think that it is an undeniable message in that film that strikes to the core of anybody who values individualism or freedom. And I don't care who you are or what stripe uh, politically you come from. When you see uh, the people that, that you captured at the various CPACs all around the world in five different countries that are documented in this film, when you see the, uh, the fear and anger and uh, emotion from these people in, in, in the fight of these people to fight for their freedoms and, f and to look to America as the beacon of democracy and hope, you really come away with a very powerful emotional feeling from this film. And I just don't think anybody can deny it. So um, this obviously makes for good uh, theatrics and film, but um, do you think that, and certainly with the travels you did as well, do you think that um, our travels are making a real impact? Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, it conveys in the film so well. Uh, and and with, with your narration and telling the story along with Dan and Ian and Mercy, it, it all comes together in a, in a beautiful story of, of what's going on globally and what's going on in America. It actually foretold a lot of things that yes. have, have gone on. It, you know, it, you I know keep, it was I keep very much on the cusp. Like you said, Jason, our theme overseas was um, being an ally to freedom fighters as they face socialism, Marxism, communism, collectivism, whatever, you know, ism is your term of choice. Maybe they have slightly different definitions, but it's all part of the same evil. Um, as people, uh, as we as we went over internationally, we then came back and had our domestic CPAC, America versus Socialism. Now fast forward to what we're dealing with, with um, racial animosity, with uh, big city mayors cozying up to radicalized groups. Um, we sure picked the right theme. Boy, I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable what, what you did last year in laying the foundation and what is actually coming into our lives right now in, in what you just uh, mentioned. It is unbelievable. Uh, we thought that we had, uh, I think there was a lot of people that thought that they, they, were, uh, they had to elect socialists in order to get socialism. But it turns out the socialists were already elected in the form of de Blasio, in the form of Mariel Bowser, in the form of Elian Omar and all these others uh, who are tearing their cities apart and, and basically making them indistinguishable from Venezuela and other places. Uh, and so this film really captured uh, people all around the world and in America who knew the dire warnings were, were being flashed out there saying, look, we are so dangerously close to socialism. And if we don't stand up and fight, then our country is, is gone. Uh, Jason, one of the things I really want to credit you with is the idea that conservatives have got to become much more flexible uh, and uh, entrepreneurial in how we communicate our philosophy and educate people. Um, conservatives believe that there's one model uh, in order to uh, you know, effectively educate folks, both in America and overseas. And I think what we've learned is that model is not working. Uh, America is increasingly radicalized, split apart. Uh, institutions are being lost left and right. Corporate boards have uh, become tools of this socialist left. And uh, we've seen the dire consequences of what happens. 
uh, when that happens in big, important countries overseas. We see what's happening uh, in Hong Kong. Um, we see what's happened to a great country like Venezuela now being under the uh, stranglehold of communism. Um, it's awfully important that conservatives shuck aside tactics that are not working and start thinking anew about how we communicate. And through video, through documentaries, through movies, through shorts, through s short videos, um, we want to partner a lot more with you uh, to make sure that we use these important platforms um, to get the message across because America is literally at stake. Do you agree? I absolutely do. Hallelujah to everything you just said. I mean, we cannot cede the, the culture to the left. We cannot cede uh, television and movies and everything that we consume every single day in life and that kids look at and schools and everything. We cannot cede that to the left and say, oh, they're just good at making you know, films, Hollywood's, you know, we'll just let them be Hollywood. That's fine, but we need to jump in the game too uh, because we realize that there's a, there's a great story to be told here, a great story that's not being told in the media. And so if we can get out there and express what's going on, when we're looking at protests and we're looking at that turn into riots often, and we know that, that unfortunately a lot of this that's going on in this country right now, unfortunately, is not centered around what happened with George Floyd, but is centered around mayors and socialist politicians using these types of issues to advance their socialist agenda, to right. denigrate everything we believe, honor, and help hold sacred, to erase our past so that there are no guideposts to the, for the future. This is what these people are doing, and we need to be able to tell that story and tell it forcefully. That's right, Jason. Well, we're going to partner with you to make sure that happens. We appreciate your award-winning work. CPAC, I mean, you got to give us a little bit of credit. We decide to kind of do a documentary, uh, and uh, so far we're one for one in the sense that it's award-winning, it's impactful. Stay tuned. We're going to do um, uh, be uh, announcing ways in which you can watch the full documentary. Uh, we're going to make sure we do something live and in person because none of us want to be locked down anymore, but also allow you all to see it digitally. And please take this commitment from me um, and from Dan and from Ian and Karin and the rest of the team here. We're going to keep coming at you digitally with content that you can digest quickly, uh, that is interesting and helps you be ready for the battle that we're facing. And we believe America is literally literally at an inflection point where the America that we want so badly to continue to be might not any more continue on that path if we're not successful in getting more young people and getting more immigrants and getting more people from diverse uh, communities and just getting more of people that come from uh, suburbia and the inner cities and everywhere to understand what really makes America great. We've asked that question as a CPAC community many times. We really do believe we have the answers. We just need more people to understand that those answers will bring joy in their lives and make for this wonderful country. So Jason, thanks for all your great work. Thanks for being with us on CPAC Live. We're going to be with you Wednesday for another episode, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Go to conservative.org and join the conversation. We're going to be joined by the great Nigel Farage. You should be following Nigel on Twitter as he talks about the increased radicalization of what's going on uh, in the UK. We'll also be joined by somebody who's making a real difference on the ground, Charlie Kirk of Turning Point, someone I consider a friend. Uh, we're going to have a great show for you on Wednesday. Until then, take care. We look forward to seeing you.